Welcome to Suzanne's studio, and I'm Suzanne Barnett, your host. Tonight, I am so honored to have as my guest, Zayra Eve. Now, Zayra is an artist, and she's a poet, and she's an author, and she is hot. Uh, let me first tell you a little bit about Zara. Zara is a local independent artist who has exhibited throughout the Bay Area. But wait till you hear this. I couldn't believe it. Her poetry has been published on five continents and 56 countries. I mean, hello. <laughs> Zara, welcome. Thank you, Susan. I can't believe your bio, it's just wonderful, and you're so young and so talented. Okay, first, I want to hear about you. How did this all come about? Well, that's a really big question. How did it all come about? Yeah. Where, you, where do you want me to start? You want me to start with the art, or? Yeah, let's talk about the art, and then we'll show your paintings. So the art started probably when I was a kid. And I didn't start painting, though, until later. But there were a lot of other artistic and creative things that I got involved with as a child. And then, you know, progressively, as I got older, it moved from things like collage work or, you know, photo collage work. And then I started experimenting with painting. Um, I was kind of going to school a little bit for that. And then I decided I wanted to travel instead. So then I started traveling and painting, and that was when my painting really started to open up because I would travel with different teachers or people who were masters in their field and you know well-known, and I would go and spend a couple of weeks with them in Spain or something like that. And that was how my art started to open up more for me. And we were talking before the show, and you were talking about, I, I said, you must have had quite an art background you know, at the universities, but tell what you said. So really, I didn't have that much of an art background at the universities. What happened was I um, went to the San Francisco Art Institute with my portfolio, and I had not gone anyplace else except for Foothill College, and I went into the Art Institute, and I brought in my portfolio, and they actually accepted me that day based on my portfolio, and this was, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and to be accepted that day on the spot was kind of unheard of, and so um, then I just I wrote a paper, and they accepted me, and so then I went for a semester, and I found that I felt really stifled by it. It wasn't what I expected. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And I don't know what I thought it was going to be, but you know, I mean, the Art Institute has the Diego Rivera mural painted there and you know, all this great history. And so I thought somehow I would connect with it. And I didn't. So I felt a little discouraged and I um, actually deferred uh, for about a year. I, I didn't go to school. And then I skipped and I went over to UC Berkeley and I started taking some classes with them and then I started skipping around taking film classes and painting classes and creative writing classes. And I found that with the, the painting, I felt really stifled every time I would get into these classes. That, you know, it was good for technique, but it wasn't as good for trying to explore. And the way I wanted to explore, I wanted to feel a certain freedom with the creativity that somehow I just wasn't able to access in the classroom. You know, and I know some people have had great success with it. I mean, I have some friends who have an, an MFA and it's, you know, been the greatest thing that they ever did. But for me, it didn't work that way. No, I see you as being such a free spirit. And when you read some of your poetry, that is what I call hot. <laughs> well, tell us, we, we have two paintings of yours, so let's, uh, just tell us how this went over here so, to my left. Okay, so yeah. this Th that one, one here, yeah. yeah. That one there, um, I call that one the marriage of spirit. And actually the, the torn part of the breast is a collage, it's from a collage piece that I uh, painted when I was in Spain. And I could not seem to get this piece to work at all. And I was doing things like soaking it in the bathtub and you know really extreme things. And it was time to pack and go home. And I got upset and I just ripped out the breast and put the breast in my suitcase and came home. And then I was working on this painting and this other figure showed up in the painting, but she seemed to somehow be so uh, otherworldly that she didn't seem to be grounded enough or part of the world at all. And I like my paintings as well as my art um, and my poetry to have a, a kind of combination of the reality of the world that we're in and the sensuality of the world and the suffering of the world mixed with this kind of, um, ineffable 
spiritual, mystical part of us as well that's not as easy to pin down. So it's, that's why I call it the marriage of spirit because it's like bringing the two together. Um, and so I just got this idea to, you know, stick the collage piece on there and then it was like done. You know, and sometimes you don't, with paintings, you don't know what they're going to be like until they're done, that, you know, that they have to talk to you in their own way. They have their own journey. Okay. I always ask my artists this question, how, how does this come to you? I mean, what happens? What happens in your head and your body when you start painting? You know, that's, it's, that's a little bit hard to answer. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. It's kind of hard to answer. You know, the creativity in, in, in and of itself in a bigger way is just part of me. And so I find that no matter what I'm doing, I always feel this creativity in me. So whether it comes out through a poem or it comes out through a painting. With the paintings, I find I'm working through something that's more physical. And so the paintings sometimes are a little more frustrating because I might actually... Um, work on a painting for a long time. In fact, the painting we were just talking about has another painting underneath it. So it's not uncommon for my paintings to have three or four paintings underneath them because I keep working with it and keep working with it. So it's, it seems to me like it's more about working something, the unknown, that's more physical. It's more from the belly to paint and less from the mind or the intellect for me. You know, for you. Yeah, for me. Now, what about the uh, the other painting in back of Yeah, me? the one that's yeah. behind you. Yeah. That one's called um, The Flower of, of the, the Alchemy. And it has to do with the way that you can take two opposites and, and through this kind of alchemical, soulful, you know, the mixture of the world and the spirit, you can have your own personal transformation. That painting could also be about lovers. It's one of the reasons why there's no, I don't put a, a lot of faces on my work. I don't have a lot of work with the detail of eyes and mouth and face. Not because I can't draw it. I actually can draw something exactly the way it looks if I so choose. I just find that to be really kind of tedious, and so I don't go in that direction. I like to leave uh, something to the imagination. And is sometimes if it has a real direct face on it, then we're, we feel that imposed. You know what I mean? I do. So, yeah. I do. Okay, we're going to go on now to your CDs. Okay. So do you want to tell us about those? And not only that, but you, uh, in, in our control room, we're going to play three of them in just a couple of minutes. But maybe you could, you know, tell us about how, sure. that, how those came about. Sure. There. So I have Crown Compassion. Yeah. And this one has more to do with my travels and, and things that I've done with traveling. Um, I traveled extensively through Africa and, and Mexico and I've just traveled all around. And so on Crown Compassion, I have um, one poem that we're gonna hear, which is a mixture of Northern Africa and Southern Africa. It's got a combination of things in it from Egypt and then it's mixed with a combination of things from South Africa, from the animals and things like that. Um, and then we also have another CD that's called uh, Sleep in the Sea, Tonight with Me. And this is the sexy CD. This is the CD that's for lovers. And this CD tells the story of lovers. So this one starts out in the beginning with, um, you know, the way that you fall in love, the way that it's just bigger than you are. It's just as big as the universe and this, this person that you're in love with can do no wrong. And then it moves through all the nuances of relationship. And the middle of the CD is very passionate, very sexy. And then it goes into the heartbreak. And then it goes back to this transcendental place of, well, you know, you're on the sea floor, just like, you know, begging the mother of God to give you this love one more time. Because even though it was all this heartbreak, it was also really worth it. Did that happen to you? Of course. Otherwise. <laughs> Of course, you know, if, you, if it doesn't happen to you, you're not living your life. Exactly. You're not exactly. getting anywhere. How do you get through it at the very end? At the very end? The heartbreak. The heartbreak. Well, I think you, really this is true for me. I don't know if this is true for everybody else, but for me, I really have come to kind of a transcendental, for lack of a better word, place with it. Does it does it mean there's no pain or you don't feel any pain with it? It's No, it's more like you come to understand that even if somebody only loved you with half of their heart, or even if you only loved somebody with half of your heart, it, it, it was good enough. 
and there's this sense of it being, it, it's good enough that we loved it all. And I have a kind of peace with that that I don't really know how to explain, but I feel a lot of peace knowing that I really deeply loved and I've been really deeply loved. And maybe we couldn't love each other the way we wanted to. I mean, you know, maybe sometimes it's just not possible. It doesn't mean that somebody didn't love you at all or that you didn't love them. But that's how your, your poetry pours out of you. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's hear the first one. Here we go. Faded hieroglyphs. There are eternal images somewhere I have been in my dreams. I long to return to the sands where lions roam, sit as sun statues, and roar in the night winds. I have heard them singing of golden rings, of fire in my belly, while ashes in my... Wow. Thanks. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. What's the next one? Could you tell us? The next one is from Sleep in the Sea Tonight with Me, and it's my favorite off of that Lover's album. Okay. Yeah. Is that the hot, sexy album? That's the hot, sexy album. Okay, yeah, well, that's the must Boys, have. <laughs> let's play that. <laughs> Is that your favorite? That's my favorite. That is your favorite. That is my favorite. When you start to, uh, when you start to write your poetry, Zara, uh, it does it come easily, or it, I mean, how does that happen for you? Right. So, well, when I first started writing poetry, it didn't come as easy to me because I was trying to be more mechanical about it, more technical. In fact, Sleep in the Sea Tonight with me is a villanelle. It's one of the few um, in form poems that I have um, because I found that writing in form, again, was very constraining, and we already know I rebel against that. So um, I had to go more into free verse, and then I also had to go more into kind of the emotional aspect of it as well. Um, and I know that that wasn't very popular with poetry, and I would have, you know, I had an instructor even say to me, you know, you should write more like Anton Chekhov. You should, you know, take it and make it colder, you know, I don't want it to be so warm. And I thought, well, you know, that's just not poetry for me. I just don't want to even listen to it. So it, it, it kind of is something that it became more like a prayer or, or you know, more of a, of a feeling that just emerged instead of censoring it and trying to fit it into a box, I just decided to open up and, and let it be. And then I would read in coffee shops and stuff, and people would you know, stop what they were doing and listen. And I realized that the people liked it, so to speak, that maybe in the workshops and different places, you know, maybe it wasn't as well received initially by the ivory tower. But, but obviously, you're very, very popular and famous if you are in 54 countries. 56 countries. Oh, 56. Yeah. And five continents. Yeah, well that all happened through the internet and that happened through me deciding to be an independent artist. So I had been published and I have been published, you know, in all these different places. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I decided that I wanted to be, you know, the executive producer of my own work. And so I created a website and I created, you know, a place to, to start doing this. And of course, I first started out on MySpace. That's where everybody starts out, right? So as it started to grow on MySpace, you know, then I realized there was something happening here. And I realized that while maybe in the ivory towers, I'd been sort of, you know, shunned a little bit by the instructors. Oh, that's not poetry. I heard that many times. Yeah, I did. I realized then, though, that people received it, that like real people. You know, my mom, who's a very, very religious woman, could receive my work. And I started to feel like if you, it was almost like religion, in that for me, religion only was going to work if it was good everywhere. 
-hmm. you know, not just in the church. Mm -hmm. And so poetry became the same kind of feeling. It was going to have to be something that everybody could somehow feel something and understand something from and maybe all of a sudden like poetry again because poetry has also become you know a dying kind of art like That's people right. don't really like it you know in fact you say poetry they're like huh eh, I don't know and then they listen to my work and they go wait a second I don't even like poetry and I liked your work so it just kind of was spreading itself that way um, and I feel really grateful for that and, and, and was kind of surprised. And the first time um, that I sold a CD someplace far away was in Turkey. And I remember I looked on the internet and it said, oh, you know, so-and-so in Turkey just bought one of your CDs. And I just jumped out of my chair and ran across the house and was like, oh, my God, somebody in Turkey just bought one of my CDs. But what about the language? How do these uh, people understand? Maybe they don't even need to because right. they hear the music. A lot well, of people unfortunately, do know English. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, you know, we, we, the English colonized quite a few yeah. countries. Yeah. Okay, so. let's talk about your books now. Okay. Okay. So, um, Ordinary Substance is actually, this is actually my second book. And this has an introduction in it by Bill Harris. And Bill Harris actually was involved, uh, he has a, 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 a group called Center Point Research and he does a lot of meditation and, and things like that. And he was involved with The Secret and he's just involved, oh, really? yeah, he's involved with like a lot of the human development movement and a lot of people that are involved in that. And so he, he came and found my work through this website that I was involved with called Integral Naked, which is um, through Ken Wilber. And so there's all this whole mystical, philosophical, spiritual movement. And Bill Harris really liked my work. And so I asked him if he'd write the introduction to this book. And so he wrote the introduction to this one. Now the work that's in here is mostly like Taoist and Buddhist. And I was kind of going down that road at the time where I was really exploring a lot of, um, a lot of things to do with Buddhism and Taoism and I was going to a lot of meditations and things like that so that book is written from that perspective and kind of taking the poem and using the literally using the poem in a different kind of way say I had a poem set that was um, you know this is the kind of poem your mother warned you about and then I would go into this whole thing of you know the poem that you know was like a person you'd been warned you know warned about and so I tried to treat the poetry more in that book mm -hmm. like in and of itself it was an entity the poem in and of itself was a body was a person and so it's not quite as personal in the other sense that I'm not necessarily talking about a specific lover or my child or something like that um, this book empty as nirvana is still the favorite book out of all my books and it's my first book um, it's a little rusty around the edges um, but a lot of the poems in here are also the poems that are on crown compassion and a lot of these poems were the lovers poems and were poems to do with travel especially through africa so i have quite a few poems in here about africa and the title being empty as nirvana in that i was starting to realize that trying to achieve this place of bliss was not necessarily what I thought it was going to be. Just like falling in love and loving somebody deeply wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be either. And that, you, you know, you're always told you're supposed to be trying to reach some pinnacle, some zenith, mm -hmm. right? And then you find out, you get there, it's kind of empty in its own way and you can't really understand why. And then you start to realize that there's like this empty full thing there's this place where you can't totally express what you want to express. And that's really where the art and the poetry keeps coming from, is trying to express this kind of aliveness that we feel, no matter what's happening, no matter how we label it. There's something pulsing in us that just is completely alive. Um, and then my, my last most recent published book, Color Me Pomegranate, is a very exciting book. Um, the women love this because it's all about women. Um, does not mean that it excludes men and it's not anti-male, but it is all about women. Every single poem in here is told from the perspective of a woman. It has to do with women's psyche, all the different things. The mad woman, the crazy woman, the pole dancer, the mother, the mother who abandons her children, the one who loves criminals, the one who's a goddess, you know, Medusa, Sylvia Plath, Anne oh, Sexton. This is outrageous. And um, a lot of the women that have bought it, they will send me emails and say, oh my God, I was on, you know, page 25 and I was just in tears. And I had one woman, you know, just send it me and she's like, you're just, you would you read? Would you read something, one of your favorites? From that book? You want Whichever to read one sure. you want. 
Well, since you like this one, I could yeah. read something to okay. you from this one. Sure. Okay. Um, this one is called, I wrote this one about a friend of mine who was a nun for many years. I want to tell you this first because I love this poem. She was a nun for a really long time. And then she decided to let that go. And she went into Buddhism and meditating and things like that. And her story, when she told it to me, it inspired me so much. And she told it to me during Christmas. And it was a poinsettia sitting on my table. And so this is inspired by her and the poinsettia at the same time. It's called Red Bells and Star Flowers. In meditation, they say, open to a better you. And the nun with glowing skin drops her, her robes after years of waiting to wear red and gold. Some part of her is still in another century across the Andes, plucking pointed weeds from the side of the road. From her heart blooms a fuchsia, a star flower, possessed by more than one name, poinsettia, Mexican flame rose, and bleeding sun, the rough equivalent of angels, while the other dames are conspicuously absent, ghost orchid, blue iris, and daffodil. In search of dancing girls with painted hair, all through Spain, Peru, and Venezuela, she finds her face open in color, ladies that bloom into prophecies of love under an artist's brush with scarlet names, Tulip, Azalea, Delilah, Lily, and Jasmine. <laughs> so anyways, she loved the poem, so. But you know, what I find so interesting, and I guess it's because um, I've interviewed a lot of people, and I love to know how it happens, Zara. You know, I keep asking I know, that you question. Keep asking that question. I know, but when you st okay, let's just okay. Mm -hmm. Say you you were in South Africa, mm -hmm. and you were, you know, obviously very oppressed, very inspired. So, is the process for you just to sit down and it just comes out of you? At this point in my life, it is that way, and then maybe to some extent it was always that way, but not so much with poetry. I mean, when I was 12, I decided I wanted to write, and I was in a Christian school, and I went to the teacher, and I said, okay, I've decided what I want to do, because he wanted everybody to think about what they want to do when they grew up. And I said, okay, I've decided. And I said, but I don't think it's possible. And he said, okay, well, what is it? And I said, well, I want to be a writer, and I want to write books and poems and all this. And he said, it is possible. And in fact, I dedicated Empty as Nirvana to him, and he has, he has since passed away, but I dedicated that book to him because I told him, I said, someday, if I ever have a book, I'm going to dedicate it to you because he so inspired me with that. Now, that said, going home and writing a poem wasn't easy. And in fact, I didn't write a poem until I was in my mid-20s somewhere. So I spent many years memorizing the Bible at the church school and being influenced by literature and this kind of stuff. But in terms of a creative outlet, it wasn't until later. Um, I find that for me, it just became cathartic. It just, it did just come out of me. Um, I don't know how to not do it. It's, it's more like that. I don't know how to not do it. It is always in my mind that I've pulled over on the side of the road to write poems. I, I've written poems in airplanes. I've written them in bathrooms. I've written them on post-it notes during board meetings. Um, I've written them, you know, the morning after, and I've written them, you know, wherever it came to me. Um, and in terms of putting it with the music, now I don't write the music. What I do is I find a group of artists, you know, musicians to work with, and then I read the poetry and they write the music. And so all of the music is improv on every CD. Um, none of it is pre, you know, we don't determine any of it before we get into the studio. How can we get in touch with you? We're putting your web page, but let's do it again. Okay, so you can get in touch with me. It's www.zayraeves.com. Yeah, but spell. Oh, Z-A-Y-R-A-Y-V-E-S.com. Like Eve San Loren. Yes. Dot com? Dot com. Dot com. That's right. Well, we only have a few minutes left, so uh, we need to uh, talk about your, very quickly, your book that's just about to be published, and you're going to... That's right. We're going to get a preview right. of one of your poems, and then I think we're going to have to end. I know. It's gone by but so fast. I know it. I told you. So my newest book was a little bit difficult for me to write, but it's all love poems, the entire thing. So it's new love poems and previous love poems, and the title of the book is called The Secrets 
of Unknown Flowers. Ooh. And I'm getting ready to release it in about two weeks. And this is one poem from that called Beautiful Love, That's You. Fragrant with kisses and laughter, your flowering mouth is more lovely than any gift you have given, more shelter than anything I own. In this dance of fire and longing, you have touched me, and I have become myself again. You bring the sky to our bed and paradise to the night. In this world of cycles and majesty, my body is marked with your voice, is painted with your eyes. With you at my side, desire is crushed and poured into the softness of your lips. Beautiful love, that's you. With a smile of sweet radiance, you walk in the body of my beloved, full of sunlight, ripe, wild, tender as this moment, where I'm at the edge of go what goes without saying, and you are the mystery that enchants me, the familiarity of what comforts me. Now my heart is full of flowers, honey, and sparrows. Come, let us go share this earth, this flame, and burst of stars as I breathe in all that you are, flowering mouth and the dance of fire and longing, sanctuary of sky, song of majesty, and my body is marked with your voice. Beautiful love, that's you. Boy, you must have a very hot boyfriend. <laughs> that's all I can say. Yeah, well, I guess he thinks so, too. <laughs> Zara, Zara, I, we really have just about run out of time, yeah. but you are going to return in the fall, and we're going to talk about another subject that this audience is just going to go wild over. And I want to thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. You are thank really you. a joy. I appreciated it. To thank you interview believe me and I, I absolutely say this whether we run out of time or not we have a wonderful crew that is so creative and so dedicated and I just am so appreciate appreciative to have them and I thank them and I want to thank my audience for watching and I can't wait to see you next time bye bye <laughs>